Uh, thanks, Frank. Uh, my name is Katie Vidazdi, as Dr. Anna said, um, and I'm going to be focusing on a, a pretty specific injury, uh, particularly around the knee joint. Um, and I'll go through what osteochondritis desiccans is. It's an injury to the cartilage and the subchondral bone, and it's most commonly seen in the knee, so that's where we'll focus on it today. Um, first, we'll go through the normal articular anatomy, so you can see what we're referring to. Uh, then I'll discuss the <coughs> pathoanatomy of the OCD lesions. Uh, then go over a little bit of the background, the etiology, um, how they present, and how we diagnose them, uh, some of the radiographic findings, and then treatment options. So first, when you look uh, at the knee, uh, this is looking at it from the front, or an AP when you're looking at the x-ray. Um, and what you can see are a couple things. There's cartilage on the end of the bone. This is the bone here, and then at the end you see cartilage. This is the meniscus, and that's a type of cartilage as well. Uh, most, what we're talking about with the OCD lesion is an injury to the cartilage and the bone right underneath that um, in the uh, knee joint. Um, when you look over uh, to the side here, you can see, as we've talked about uh, earlier, is the open physis, and that's the growth plate. And these injuries most commonly occur uh, in adolescents or kids who do have an open growth plate. This is a little bit more specific, looking at the uh, subchondral, uh, the articular cartilage right here, this white, and then the subchondral bone, which is the bone right underneath that cartilage, and that's really where this injury occurs. So the injury is a focal injury. It's not a diffuse injury, which we would see in arthritis of the knee, osteoarthritis, some of the older patients where the cartilage breaks down more diffusely throughout the knee joint or throughout the end of the um, uh, bone there. We're looking more at a focal injury or a focal spot. Um, and you can see in both of these images that there's injury to the cartilage. And uh, right here, this is all cartilage that's worn off. And what we can see is that exposed subchondral bone. And that's, generally speaking, not a good thing. Um, the background on this, it's more common in boys. It usually presents um, prior to growth plate cro closure, uh, which is a good thing because the prognosis is better if the growth plate is open. Um, most commonly it presents in the knee and it usually presents on the inside uh, of the knee so it's actually uh, on the lateral aspect or the outside aspect of the medial side of the knee and that's really the most common uh, location for these to present. There, there's a classification or um, a gradient of how severe the injuries are. In the first um, grade you can see um, you really just have an inside uh, injury there's no displacement. There's, if you looked inside of the knee through an arthroscopy or if you opened it up, you would see normal cartilage. You actually probably wouldn't even notice an injury. Um, but what you're seeing is some loosening or injury to that subchondral bone. Then you have an early separation as the next phase where you're actually having separation of that subchondral bone from the rest of the uh, bone at the end of the uh, femur bone in the case of the knee. And then in the third phase, you start to have some detachment of that. And if you looked in, what we're looking for is if there's any detachment of the cartilage and then of that subchondral bone. And you, we look at this on uh, x-ray and MRI clearly before you would see it, looking at it uh, through a scope. And then in the last case, that entire uh, fragment comes off and you can have a loose body that's actually floating in the knee. Um, what causes these? A lot of times it's actually unknown. So we don't have a good answer for a patient why this happened to you in particular. Um, but often it's ischemia to the subchondral bone. So it's thought that there's not enough blood supply to a certain area uh, of the end of the femur that's causing it. Um, that's often a result of repetitive stress of that subchondral bone. So as what Dr. Uh, Cohen said, it's again can be a repetitive or an overuse injury that we're seeing. It's not always just an acute traumatic injury uh, that causes this. And then there's some thought that there's some family history or growth disturbance that can be associated with it as well. Um, what are the symptoms that patients present with? Um, pain is the most common. Um, if they have a, any loosening of that lesion, then they can present with mechanical symptoms where there's catching, clicking, or clunking. On physical exam, if there is any loosening, and even if there's not, you can see an effusion or fluid on the knee. And then you can also get tenderness on that uh, location of the end of the uh, knee, the end of the femur. You can actually get point tenderness right in that region. OK. So 
So here's an x-ray looking at uh, the knee from the front uh, on the left hand side and then uh, from the side. And what you can see if you look at the end of the bone here is that's not a completely uh, flat or normal surface to the end of the bone. You see an irregularity right inside that red circle. And you can see the same thing uh, where that yellow arrow and inside the red circle is on the, uh, looking from the side. And then when you see this in a patient, clearly it's a little concerning. So the next step often is to get an MRI to better understand the extent. Is this an in situ lesion where there's just some loose, um, no separation? Or do we have a larger lesion where that whole um, uh, cartilage and subchondral bone fragment has actually become loose? And that helps us determine the treatment plan. So when you look at the MRI, again, within the red circle there, you can see that there's a white area right here, which uh, basically is the subchondral bone area. And in this case, that cartilage is still intact. And you can see the same thing uh, looking at it from the side. That's not normal. The rest of the knee, sort of on this side, if you look, um, compare it, there's no injury to that subchondral bone, and that's significant. So the prognosis, how well is this patient going to do, depends on if the physis is open. If we, um, most of the time these injuries, is, they're thought to occur before the physis closes, but sometimes patients don't present until later on because they've just had an aching pain in their knee, and they may not present until they're, you know, in their later adolescent years or early adult years. And if they still have the lesion at that time, the prognosis is not as good. If we catch it earlier on, we're able to treat it appropriately, then often they heal and go on to have uh, normal function, no problem with the knee. Uh, the next is the stability of that lesion. If we just see some injury to that subchondral bone, no loosening of the cartilage, and certainly no loose fragment, they have a better prognosis than if it uh, extends all the way and has a loose fragment. And then the size is very significant. So the smaller the lesion, uh, the better the mm -hmm. prognosis. What are the treatment options? Um, there's certainly, for most cases in the pediatric adolescent patient, non-operative management is going to be the appropriate way to start. Um, um, but in many cases, you do have to look to surgery if it's one of the more significant or um, serious injuries. So for the non-operative um, candidates, which most patients are, the articular cartilage is going to be intact, and it's going to be one of the smaller lesions. If you see a lesion, it's unstable. There's a crack in the cartilage. It looks like that subchondral bone has separated. Um, it's a larger lesion. Um, or if they have failed non-operative uh, management for one of the above um, lesions, um, or if they're very close to having that physis close, where they don't have as much healing potential, then they may be more in the category where it's appropriate to treat it with surgery. So the non-operative uh, management is pretty specific, but it varies, it depends on the extent of the lesion, the age of the child, the size of the lesion, and how well they're progressing. Not every kid is going to fall into an exact guideline, and that's an important thing to, a discussion to have with parents, that I can give you some basic guidelines from day one when I see the patient and when we get the MRI, but that could vary depending on how well your child does. So the first phase can last from zero to 12 weeks, and again, there's variation. Uh, and it's going to be immobilization, often with crutches, so it's non-weight bearing. And you'll use an unloader brace, and what that brace will do is unload that inside of the knee and take some of the stress off of that subchondral bone and allow um, that area to heal, prevent any more ischemia or loss of blood supply. Again, non-weight bearing. Before moving on, the patient should be pain-free. So before you move to the next stage, and that's why there's variation, um, the patient should have no pain. The next stage is going to be they can be weight bearing is tolerated. You're not going back to running. Um, as is, has been mentioned earlier, it's not as soon as we finish phase one, you're going back to the football field. Um, you're going to go back to weight bearing is tolerated. You can get rid of the crutches. And you're going to start doing low impact strengthening exercises, not impact sports. Um, and then when you move on to phase three, you're going to start doing more impact, more agility exercises, high impact and sheer activities. Um, an MRI may be repeated at this time if there are any symptoms, um, just to see the progression of the healing to ensure that that lesion is healing appropriately before we um, progress the athlete to full activity. If the symptoms return, um, then it may be appropriate to uh, get x-rays, as we said, or get an MRI. If we have to, sometimes you have to regress and go back to phase two or phase one if it appears that that lesion is not healing um, or if the patient has um, symptoms. Um, and 
again, as we said, if they haven't healed in that six month period and you see that lesion either staying the same or progressing, then surgery may be appropriate even if it is a stable lesion. So the goals of surgery are to relieve pain and improve the function, uh, restore the histology or to restore uh, that normal cartilage and subchondral bone. You wanna try to stimulate the healing, um, improve the cartilage uh, biomechanics and prevent further degenerative changes. Um, there are multiple options and they really depend on all of the things that we've discussed. That's the severity of the injury, how long it's been <coughs> present, the size, the location, the age of the individual. The first for the, and these are sort of from um, less invasive to more invasive, would be uh, an arthroscopic surgery where you're either drilling the cartilage or if all of the cartilage and subchondral bone is exposed, you're doing a microfracture, and I'll show you examples of these. Um, the next would be if you have a loose fragment, you're actually, um, whether or not it's floating or it's just unstable, you're fixing that, um, and sometimes you need to use bone graft. Uh, the next would be an osteochondral autograft transfer, and I'll show you these. Um, and, um, and that's where you're taking cartilage from one part of the knee and putting it into that lesion. The next is where you're actually taking chondrocytes, you grow them from uh, the patient, and then you implant them in at a later time. And then the last would be a, um, an allograft, um, where you're placing that allograft within the uh, lesion. So the first, the drilling or the microfracture, this is an example, you look inside the knee and that looks like pretty normal cartilage. If you were to put a probe on that or press on that, you would see that it's flexible. It's more like a trampoline, it's not solid like the cartilage should be. And that's because there's injury to that subchondral bone and it doesn't have the same support that it should. Uh, so the goal is um, to stimulate vascular in, uh, ingrowth and stimulate the subchondral bone healing. Well, that video's not working. Basically, all it shows is this little drill here is gonna drill multiple holes right in that cartilage. And what that does is stimulates um, the vascular ingrowth into that subchondral bone, and it allows it to heal from the undersurface. So you are putting little holes in the cartilage, which may seem um, that you're injuring it, but you're stimulating the growth, and that heals well. The second option is if that lesion um, has complete loss of the cartilage, like you can see here, you go in and you place small holes within the bone and that stimulates, um, again, the vascular supply uh, and uh, healing of that subchondral bone. And then you basically get a scar formation. You don't get the um, healing um, or regrowth of that same cartilage, but hopefully you get enough, sc essentially, scar formation uh, with different types of cartilage that you won't have any progression of the lesion. If the lesion is um, unstable or hinged, as you can see, this one has been placed, um, repaired with two screws, so it's held in place. That's either with a fragment that's hinged off, it's unstable. You can just arthroscopically place screws right through it and hold it in um, position. If there's injury to the subchondral bone, you have a lack of bone on the undersurface of that cartilage, sometimes you need to put some bone graft in that area. And that's there. Um, the this is the osteochondral um, autograft transfer. What you're doing in this situation is you're taking um, parts of the cartilage and the subchondral bone from a non-weight-bearing surface of the knee. So this is a non-weight-bearing surface. This cartilage doesn't really see any of the impact uh, of the knee. And then you'll transfer those bone plugs uh, over to a different region of the knee where that OCD lesion is because the weight-bearing surface clearly sees more stress and you want to um, repair that lesion. And here's an example where that lesion uh, used to be present right here, and now there's a, a plug uh, that was placed. And we'll see if this one works. Okay, it's not working. Okay, so that's just showing, this is an example where you're taking the cartilage uh, lesion, uh, cartilage um, implant, from the side here, and then you'll be putting it back into uh, where the oats, where the um, OCD lesion was. Okay. Um, the next option 
And this often is used if a patient has failed some of the previous surgeries. So if they've had either the arthroscopic drilling, um, if it's a, uh, it can't be too large of a lesion, then what you can actually do is take chondrocytes from the patient, you grow them, and then you place them back into uh, the lesion and you cover it either with a, a piece of periosteum, which is the lining of the bone, or with another graft on top. And here's an example. Uh, on the left, you can see that OCD lesion, so there's a big um, hole in the cartilage and that subchondral bone. You're taking cartilage um, that you've harvested, you've grown them for four to six weeks on the lab, and then you're re-implanting them right inside that um, defect, and you're put, you're covering it in order to hold it, because you can't just put them in and walk away, they'll fall out, clearly. Uh, so then you're covering it um, either with periosteum, which is often what you would do in a kid, or with another graft material to hold it in place and that stimulates the healing. And then the last option is uh, really preserved for, um, reserved for larger lesions. And those would be greater than 25 millimeters in diameter. And particularly in a kid, you don't want to have to go to an, uh, an allograft if you don't have to. It's cadaver bone. It's usually not ideal. But sometimes you have to. It's a large enough lesion. So what you see here on the top is a pretty significant lesion. So that's, that's not going to heal. You can't go in there and do a microfracture on that. It's too large of a lesion to put in the um, other uh, little pieces of cartilage that would be transferring that oats transfer um, would not heal or survive there. So you're actually taking a allograft or cadaver bone. You're going to measure the lesion that you have in the patient's knee. And then you take a cadaver, basically create um, a plug that's the same size, and then you implant it back into uh, the, that patient's lesion. And this is what you uh, see here, and there's actually a smaller plug as well just to fill because that was such a large defect. So just to summarize, going over osteochondritis desiccans, and we really focused on the juvenile. So this is in the adolescent or the pediatric patient. So most patients, most kids, will present with a stable lesion. In those cases, they have a very high potential to heal and most will do well with non-operative management. Um, they do, again, have to be immobilized. They have to ha wear that unloader brace. It's not an option. It's not, can I go back, you know, when can I go back to sports? If you are not compliant with that, then they won't heal. So they tend to do very well, but we do have to follow that protocol, not putting weight on it. We really have to re remove what's caused it, and that's that repetitive stress or ischemia to the bone. Um, MRI imaging is very important and very helpful for us in determining the severity of the injury, how large it is, um, and if there's any detachment of the injury to the cartilage so that we can help uh, the patient determine if they are appropriate for that non-operative management or if we need to do something more invasive. If we do have a stable lesion and we've started that non-operative management and the patient hasn't healed within six to nine months, then we do need to have the discussion with the child, with the parents, do we need to do something more aggressive because you don't want to see this become a large lesion that we then have to go do an allograft transfer, for instance. Um, unstable lesions and secondary loose bodies often do require fixation. So you put the screws in and that can be done arthroscopically. It's a, a pretty straightforward and uh, limited surgery. Um, established loose fragments, so something that's been floating around there for a while, if you've been following it or patients had complaints for a while, you can tell that um, that's an, an older injury, will tend to have poor <coughs> healing uh, potential. Um, and then the results um, of excisions of these uh, large lesions from weight-bearing zones, transferring them over um, is, uh, can be poor. Um, and then the chondral resurfacing techniques that we discussed, the OATS, the ACI, the osteochondral allograft, um, are all potentially good options in kids. Most of them don't require and you don't want to have to go to that, um, but they uh, can work very well.